Welcome to the Ecom Breakthrough Podcast. Are you ready to unlock the full potential and growth in your business? You've already crossed seven figures in sales, but the challenge is knowing how to take your business to the next level. Join Josh Hadley, an eight-figure e-com business owner and investor, as he interviews highly successful business owners. Get ready, because you're going to learn specific actions you can take today to help your business reach its full potential and leave a lasting impact on the world. Welcome to the Ecom Breakthrough Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Hadley, where I interview the top business leaders in e-commerce. Past guests include Kevin King, Howard Tai, and Roland Frazier. Today, I'm speaking with Will Russell, founder and CEO of Russell Marketing, and we will be talking a lot about creating powerful marketing systems to launch new products. This episode is brought to you by Ecom Breakthrough Consulting, where I help seven-figure companies grow to eight figures and beyond. Listen, Will, I started Hadley Designs back in 2015, and it took me seven years to grow it to an eight-figure brand. Along the way, there were a lot of mistakes and obstacles that I ran into that made the path of getting to eight figures take a lot longer than it needed to. There were times where I doubted my abilities as a leader, or I doubted whether our brand could become a household name and could survive financially. If our listeners have ran into similar problems or plateaus in their business and want to know the next steps to take their business to the next level, then go to ecombreakthrough.com. That's ecom with two M's to learn more. And as a special bonus to my podcast listeners, this month I'm giving away one $10,000 comprehensive business strategy audit session at no cost. All you need to do is email me at josh at ecombreakthrough.com and in the subject line, say strategy audit. Then plead your case as to why I should choose your business to work with for the strategy audit. But today I'm super excited to introduce you to Will Russell. He is the CEO and founder of Russell Marketing. Russell Marketing is an innovative digital agency specializing in e-commerce launch marketing. To date, they have generated more than $25 million in revenue for over 300 new entrepreneurs. Will has been featured on Forbes, Business Insider, Cranes New York, Startup Nation, and many more. Will also has launched the Russell Gives Foundation, a family foundation that offers grants and mentorship to 501c3 partners committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion. In November of 2022, Will's first book, Launch in Five, Take Your Idea from Light Bulb Moment to Profitable Business in Record Time, was published by Nicholas Breeley. So welcome to the show, Will. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me, Josh. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. Well, it, it's an honor to be speaking with somebody that is solely focused on just launching products and having specific strategies and systems that you follow. Um, What I'm super excited for our listeners to hear from you today is many of the Amazon business owners have kind of a very similar launch strategy. In the past, everybody just kind of gave out coupons and 90% discount codes in return for a reviews and things like that to, to spike the sales uh, of your product. And then a lot of people have been doing rebate strategies. And in the Amazon space, it's like everybody's doing the exact same thing. And what I'm really excited to hear are what your systems are, how you found success in launching, because your systems are going to be much different than what the traditional Amazon seller has been doing. But this is going to be super applicable for them. But Will, before we dive into all of that in the book, why don't you give our audience a background of what brought you to this point today? Certainly, yeah. So, I mean, as you can probably tell by by my accent, I grew up in the United Kingdom and I moved to the U.S. in 2009. After a little bit of of moving around, I ended up uh, settled in, in the San Francisco Bay Area. And, I mean, I'd always... Like a lot of entrepreneurs say, I'd always felt like I was going to do something along along the entrepreneurship lines. The idea of, you know, I, when I was young, I'd, I'd see my dad put on his suit and tie and, and get on the train into London and head to work. And, and I admire and commend that, but I never felt that was, that was for me. I always felt that I was going to do something of my own. And so in 2016, I mean, I dabbled a little bit prior to that, but 2016 is really when I made the made the jump and I quit my, my full-time job in the Bay Area 
And uh, I started uh, trying to build out educational content uh, around marketing. That didn't work out very well. So about a year later, 2017, I, I launched this business, uh, uh, the launch marketing business, because during the year prior, I think I've really come to learn what are the similar high-level concepts and then what are the nuances in launching across different spaces because I've worked in the nonprofit space, I've worked in public safety space, I've worked in the media space, and I've worked in the consumer product space. And, and so I, I was looking at, and in, in my previous job roles, a lot of it was around launching things, which I hadn't really made that connection up to, up to 2017. When I did make that connection, I decided, hey, this is really interesting. This is something that I can kind of productize, I suppose. It's, it's systematic. It's repetitive, uh, which is always advantageous with a service-based business. And, and so I made that dive to launch this, this, uh, this launch marketing company. And it was a good decision. So it's been onwards and upwards from there. And, and as you pointed out at the start, it's allowed me the opportunity to write a book and publish that. And it's uh, given me the opportunity to start a foundation and you know, do some work in, uh, in the philanthropic space. So all in all, it's been a heck of a journey. I, I uh, empathize and, and feel similarly minded to a lot of what you said at the start with what that journey actually feels like as an entrepreneur. Um, but we're both here today and you've given me an opportunity to talk to you on this show. And uh, that's, that's, a, that's a checkbox, you know, that's a, that's a success. And I'm happy to share uh, with your listeners some of the bits and pieces that have got me here today. Awesome. Well, Will, we're super excited to dive into that. And you have a great, great background. Um, you know, our listeners are established business owners, right? They've already found success. Um, they've been selling products on e-commerce channels. But one of the biggest strategies uh, to continue to grow from a seven-figure business to eight figures and beyond is by coming out on a regular basis with new products. So launching new products, in my opinion, is one of the best ways for a business to continue to grow and to increase their revenue. So, Will, that's honestly what your whole book is centered around. Why have you, with your agency, it's all kind of centered around product launches, right? And you're not just focused exclusively in e-commerce. You've done some events and other things as well, right? And so what... Tell us, you know, why the emphasis on product launches, so to speak? That's an, that's an excellent question and one that I've toyed with many times in, in what is that positioning. I mean, the reality is the system that we have, this five-step launch system, it is applicable to any sort of offer, whether it's a free app, whether it's signing up for an event, uh, whether it's a uh, a car, whether it's a, a cheap water bottle, you know, the whole purpose of the system was that it was universal. And obviously there's going to be differences, but I wanted the concepts to be universal and applicable in different ways. Now, the theory and reality changes because in theory, that, that's great. In reality, most entrepreneurs coming to us aren't in a super strong financial stable position. You know, this might be their first product. This might be their first business. This might be very early in their, in their progress. They might have just got some angel investment. And, and, and generally speaking, they're not in a position to push a lot of money into a launch campaign without certain returns coming back to them. With things like free events with things like apps, even app subscriptions, because let's say they're a dollar ninety nine a month or whatever, it's very, very difficult for us to put this system in place and with with a low cost app, for example, and at the end of our five, six month collaboration, be able to point to significant ROI for the client. Because if they're selling an app, I mean you probably have folks in listening who, who have software and apps and subscription based products. That, that lifetime value tends to deliver or, or that value tends to deliver more over a longer period of time. And what we do is, is condensed. It's short. It's relatively quick. Uh, so we can't look at two, three years out necessarily. And so consumer-based products, in particular products in a good price range, you know, maybe $100 to $500, that's a really good sweet spot for a system like ours to deliver returns. So I think the, the concepts and 
and the ideas and the metrics uh, that the system possesses, they will apply to any sort of offer. However, if at the end of that launch period, you need to have generated $3 for every $1 you've invested, there needs to be an order value of a decent level for the product itself. And so for things like apps and events, that may not be the reality. And so an entrepreneur may not want to implement a system like ours to get there, or they may not want to hire us to do it, hence why I published the book. And so consumer products is definitely our most common vertical. Uh, We do work with others, but the main reason for that is because most entrepreneurs we work with need to see a return. And the truth is, product with a price point in that $100 plus area is more likely to generate that return quickly than something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. So, Will, let's go ahead and, and dive into your book there and some of those strategies that you would like to share with our audience, knowing that our audience is going to be launching a lot of e-commerce specific products, right? A lot of consumer uh, product brands. And so walk us through what the ideal strategy uh, would look like for an e-commerce product launch. Right. So I'm gonna, let me share the five steps of our system and then let's apply those uh, to these particular listeners. So the five steps of the system, uh, and that's step one is validation. And that's a, roughly a four to six week period where we are collecting purchase intent around a specific offer. So we're not necessarily selling a product yet, uh, we might be taking a deposit on a future product that doesn't yet exist, something like that. It's low budget, it's a relatively short test. Uh, and what that does is gives us enough data around purchase intent to understand, okay, if we invest $50,000 or $100,000 more, what's that going to look like in terms of profitability? And what are those projections going to be? If we can look at all that information and everyone feels very positive about it, it looks good to us, then we're going to move into step two. If we realize that this validation has identified a couple of red flags, things we need to fine tune, then we're going to take that back to the client and we're going to share with them our recommendations for what we need to change and then pivot in order to make the mathematics work, essentially. Uh, so that's the validation period. Uh, super important, super easy in terms of the grand scheme of things and introduced by us a few years back as it was a really good way of saving entrepreneurs money and heartache and time with bad ideas, you know? Uh, and it was a very effective way of doing that. So and two, what metrics... So on that point, what metrics are you looking for to know if a product's going to be a winner, right? Yeah, there's a few key metrics we're looking at. The most, the most fundamental ones are going to be acquisition costs per deposit. So most, most funnels we run in validation are going to require some sort of deposit, a low deposit, maybe $5, maybe 1% of the product price point. And, and the, the key metric we're looking for there is, is can we see a cost per reservation come in that's less than a third of the likely average order value by the customer? Uh, if we can get under that range of about 33% position cost, we feel confident moving forward. And then the second key metric we're going to look at there is how many people that show interest in the solution also show interest in buying the product at the price point the entrepreneur requests. So the funnel that we're running in validation usually has a few different steps. And one of those steps is introducing a solution. No price point reference, just a solution. And we're looking for signals of interest. And then the next step for those that do express interest, we look, we introduce the price point, more specificities around the offer, and we're bookmarking, okay, well, what's the level of purchase intent? Now they understand more about what they're going to get and what it's going to cost them. And it's, we're looking at how many people express interest compared to how many people show purchase intent at a specific price point. Uh, and so it, it depends on the product, but I think 5% is probably a good average there. If we can see 5% of people expressing interest, also putting down a deposit once they see how much this is going to cost them, we feel good about it. Uh, and we, we you know, thumbs up, let's move forward, and we feel that this is scalable and profitable. Awesome. Those are some a good rule of thumb for people to be shooting towards. And I know we'll, we'll go down into sp- some specific examples as well, but let's continue with uh, step number two. 
Yeah, so step number two and step number three of our launch system, they happen concurrently. And that's audience acquisition and audience engagement. So <clears throat> by and large, there are two things we want to happen by the time launch day arrives. One is immediate traction and speed of traction, not just because we want the entrepreneur to have sales, but because the more, the more data we can collect early on, the quicker we can pivot and make changes. So firstly, we want to make sure during steps two and steps three, we are preparing this launch for traction on day one. And then we are also looking to solve objections. So especially with a new product and a new brand, there's going to be a lot of skepticism, a lot of objections coming out. Who are you? Why should I trust you? Blah, blah, blah. And usually if we're looking to launch and we need traction, we don't want to stumble on all those objections on launch day. We need them resolved before launch day happens. So steps two and steps three of our system usually last about six to eight weeks. And it's a period where we're acquiring prospective customers. So we validated the idea through that validation period. We've understood audiences and messaging. Now we can kind of pump the gas a little bit and start bringing in a lot more people into our community uh, who are expressing interest in the product, putting down deposits and engage them and communicate with them so that they are number one, incentivized and excited to take action when you do launch. And number two, they're going to have all their questions and all their objections answered. So during that period, it depends, of course, on the budgets and, and other bits and pieces, but it's really a ramp up period where we're looking to build that community and have the entrepreneur, the client we're working with, engage that community in a really meaningful way. So that when they get to step three, oh, sorry, step four, which is the conversion piece of it, which is phase three, uh, they're, they're going to have success and they're going to see a, a really nice launch day and they're going to get the data they need to, to move forward. So step four is this conversion period. For us, we, we kind of understand this conversion period just as a couple of days. Now, a, a launch period in of itself, when someone wants to have kind of a launch sales period, is probably going to last somewhere between one and three months, maybe. But step four, this audience conversion step in our system, is just a couple of days because it's that early, immediate traction. What are we seeing happen right away? What's the conversion rate on the product offer? What are email open rates looking like? And, and so on and so forth. How much are we paying on ads per product page view? Kind of metrics like that. And we're looking at how is the user actually behaving in that purchase journey? Because we've, we, in the validation, we're getting a sense of, okay, people like this product, people like this offer. But of course, until you actually present them the opportunity to purchase it on a website where they can buy it, you're not going to know exactly what's going to happen. So we want to get that behavior and that flow as quickly as possible so we understand where in that journey do we need to improve things. And then finally, once that first couple of days of the launch period is complete, we're going to move into step five, which is scale, which is where we're taking these learnings, both the learnings during the validation and pre-launch, and also these uh, behavior learnings at launch, uh, to to fine tune and expand and scale our existing strategies so that the, the entrepreneur can have as successful a launch period as possible. Awesome. So that's the that's the system. I can speak specifically to how your your listeners might want to consider some things there. But before I do, and does that make sense? Were there any questions arising or jumping yeah. through there? No, I, I love that. So step number one in the, this process is the validation phase. Right. And then we talked about some metrics that you should be shooting towards there. Step number two is the audience acquisition. Right. So you start to kind of obtain a list of, you know, interested your target market. Right. People actually using the product. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yeah. And they then, won't be using the product maybe quite yet because it might not exist. Not yet. The target market. Yes. OK. So the target market audience acquisition for your target market. And then step three. Remind me of that one. Audience engagement. So we're engaging. Engagement. Mm -hmm. Yep. So then you're engaging with that audience, right? And then leading up to step number four, the conversion process where you actually put the product up for sale, right? It goes live, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. For its first day. And you're trying to drive as much traffic those first few days, gain mm -hmm. a lot of data quickly, be able to pivot. And then your final step is to be able to scale, that yeah. correct yeah so fine. being able to do that on repeat yeah so exactly i think it all makes sense now let's get into the nuts and bolts of like how does this work if somebody is selling 
um, on Amazon, for example? Excellent question there as well. So this is the interesting thing about sales channels these days is that there are so many and, and people use lots of different sales channels to launch. And so Amazon is a great example. Obviously, Walmart now have their own marketplace, which is gaining a lot of interest. And then we have launch channels, just like a regular Shopify website. Uh, we have a lot of folks who are coming to us for crowdfunding because they haven't got the product in development yet. And each of these requires a slight adjustment uh, to the approach. But that said, the five steps and those high-level concepts, they do remain the same. You know, they remain the same. What changes is really what some of the features at, that are available to make use of on one platform that may not be available on another platform, for example. I mean, for, for Amazon, their algorithm is going to work slightly differently than what we might see on Kickstarter or Indiegogo. And so we're going to probably want to apply uh, an approach which is more focused. You talked about reviews or, or verified reviews. You know, if we're launching on Amazon, we're probably going to be building in uh, a more comprehensive review request approach earlier than if we were launching on Indiegogo. Um, so I would say for Amazon, Amazon as well, obviously there's the organic nature of Amazon and, and are you searchable and, and so on, which yes, that does apply to other channels. But if, if you're coming up with a new Shopify store for a, a new phone cover, uh, we're unlikely to be pushing hard on kind of your SEO basics um, or your SEO fundamentals there. Whereas if we're on Amazon, of course, it's really important that we get those those key bits and pieces on the, the product page uh, from the get-go. So with Amazon, and we're talking, you know, a five-step system, I think that the validation applies the same way. With Amazon, there's going to be some additional bits and pieces you can bring to that validation. There's a lot of great tools uh, that, that you can use on Amazon for keyword research or product research or volume and stuff like that which obviously aren't going to be applicable elsewhere. And that's going to play a big role in perhaps the offer you want to form or, or the accessories you might consider putting with your, your key offer. So I think with Amazon, you've got much more market research tools applicable to that particular launch platform than you do if you're launching in any other manner. Uh, and then from an acquisition standpoint with Amazon, I mean, our recommendation, you're going to be placing a lot of money through the advertising channels on Amazon. Whereas if you're launching on another platform, uh, you're probably going to be earmarking most of that budget to Google or to Meta. So fundamentally with Amazon, I think the process is condensed a little bit. You have some additional tools to help you validate and do your market research. And then you have a couple of other bits and pieces to be thinking about, such as optimization, such as review requests, um, such as acquisition sources and how that's going to work. But fundamentally, the validation to acquisition to engagement to conversion to scale that's gonna that's gonna remain the same in, in those high level concepts and even the objections you're going to be facing and you're going to be resolving or some of the tactics you're going to take to incentivize quick action which you, you went through a bunch earlier discounts and limited time opportunities and this that and the other those are all going to apply to amazon or shopify or kickstarter or wherever you're going to go so again, slightly nuances, different nuances here, but high-level concepts and even a lot of the, the strategies uh, are applicable to different platforms. It's just going to be kind of how you're going to go about it on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. What's the ideal? Maybe we can walk through maybe like a case study, for example, with a product that you've launched on just, you know, a D2C website, right? Whether it be on Shopify or whether they had their own standalone sales funnel. Walk us through, you know, each of those phases for a new product that was brought to market, whether it was on Amazon, Walmart, the channel doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Give us an example of something that you've helped kind of create. Yeah, I, one that stands out to me as a favorite isn't necessarily, well, by a long way, the biggest raise, the biggest amount of revenue that we generated on a launch. Uh, and it was a few years back, so I'd have to say that our system... Uh, wasn't as sophisticated then as, as it is now. But the one that always comes to mind as a, just such a great example of what I want my company to be uh, or to support the kind of companies I want to support was Sheets and Giggles, which was a bedding company, a sustainable bedding company that we helped launch on Indiegogo. It was, <clears throat> excuse me, 2017, 2018 period. And 
they had a successful 30 days on Indiegogo. They did about $300,000, which is a solid amount. It's As I said, it's, it's not a big, big raise for those kind of platforms, but it's um, it's very a key, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a milestone of success, and, and I think most entrepreneurs that hit those kind of numbers are very happy. So in this client was, Sheets and Googles were very happy with that launch. And then we continued working with them. So we continued working with them for about 18 more months as they built out their kind of e-commerce foundations. Uh, and then, then we stopped working with them. And, that, and the reason I think that that's such a good example is we came in as a partner to help them to validate to help them drive a lot of interest and attention and build a big community around, frankly, bedsheets, which is a really, really competitive space. Uh, It's really hard to enter that market. The the existing brands have such marketing budgets. uh, It's very expensive to run paid acquisition efforts in those channels often and and so on. So it was a tough space. The the founder of Sheets and Giggles, Colin McIntosh, just a solo founder, kind of giving it his all, you know, super passionate, super excited. And so exactly the kind of entrepreneur you want to work with. And we took them through that and we, we helped them and we partnered with them through that key validation launch and that early success. And then they went on to raise a lot more money. They're a really successful company now. Uh, they took their marketing in-house and that's okay. You know, I don't see our, I don't see us as a partner for life for a company. I see us as a useful partner in these first early stages. And so that was a great example of that. So to speak specifically to some of the metrics, if I can remember sheets and giggles. So I do remember back then, uh, one of the key metrics we were looking at was landing page conversion rate. How many, uh, how many more percentage of people were signing up and, and expressing their interest in the product? And I remember sheets and giggles had something like a 44%. It was in the 40s uh, conversion rate. And our benchmark is 20. Uh, so we already knew, okay, People like this, like this idea. They like this, this solution. Um, they seem more interested than average in what this could be. And so then we wanted to get a sense of, okay, well, but are they engaged? Do they really care? Because everyone needs bed sheets. So it's very easy to just sign up on something and say, yeah, sure, I like bed sheets. But we need to understand, you know, how much do they actually care about these bed sheets and are they actually going to end up being purchased? And at the time, we didn't have that deposit function in place. As part of our strategy, instead, we actually looked at intent in a couple of other ways. We looked at intent through things like email engagement. Uh, we looked at intent through things like survey engagement. What percentage of those leads would then complete our survey on the next page? And we'd have benchmarks that would evaluate intent based on those areas. And again, in both of those areas, the number of people completing surveys, I think, Back then, our, our metric was about 10%, and, and I can't remember exactly what SDGs was, but it was well beyond that. And then we also saw with the email engagement, and we had a Facebook group, and we saw the excitement and the engagement and the communication and, and what was happening from these prospects. And so all those signs you know, pointed in a very strong direction for sheets and giggles. We took them through that period. And I will say, and this, this is you know, something I think that, specifically can apply to uh, or, or should be acknowledged by those with existing companies and not just those starting new companies. But what we're seeing more and more now is people care about the person or persons behind the product as much, if not more so, than the actual product itself. And Sheets and Giggles was, was well ahead of the curve on that in how present and conversational and engaging the founder was with those prospective customers. He wasn't you know, hidden behind an email address or a street. He wasn't, you know, keep keeping his, 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 his hands clean and, and allowing others to do all the work. He was in those groups, responding to those emails, you know, one o'clock in the morning in preparation for launch, conversing, having phone calls with these prospects, really engaging his community. Uh, and that, again, that enthusiasm is really important. So with all these, all these data points pointed to, a successful launch and we said okay people are interested they like the product and they did launch and as i said i mean i think the goal was somewhat like i think he wanted you know something like 50 60 000 would have been a success for him if i remember correctly i might i might be missing around there and he ended up doing about 300 so he was you know blown away it was a great example of a passionate founder uh uh a very astute founder a very knowledgeable founder implementing the right system, trusting the data, trusting the right partners, trusting the right team members, 
and essentially ended up delivering a great product. And it was a great example, not just of the launch system in play, but also of the whole concept of validation and pre-order, because Sheets and Giggles, like I say, it was an Indiegogo campaign, but they went on to deliver very successfully all products and build a very successful company from that. Uh, so it was just a great use case and always a great example, and one I always point to for the clients um, and in conversations like this as to how to do it right and, and what a right, quote unquote, launch really looks like. And, and there, he has loads of great interviews as well. So if you want to see more, learn more about what Sheets and Giggles did around their launch, you can just Google Colin McIntosh or Sheets and Giggles, and he's got a bunch of interviews out there where he talks about it. But that for me was just a great example of everything working smoothly, everything going well, everything, the recipe essentially uh, working perfectly. And, uh, and for me, it was one of the early campaigns in the business. So it was all very exciting and successful and, and great to be a part of. Yeah, what a great, what a great case study. I want to dive in deeper on a couple of these aspects. When you talk about building an engaged, you know, audience or, you know, building it up a following, what are, what are the channels um, or strategies to kind of build this following of people before you've even launched a product? By and large, most people are going to lean heavily into paid acquisition. And so, you know, that means paying Facebook or Google or Reddit for ad space and driving traffic using those methods. Now, not everyone has big budgets so they can just plug in to do that. I always suggest paid acquisition because, frankly, it's the quickest and easiest way of getting from where you are to where you need to be. But I understand not everyone has the budget. So for those that don't have those budgets or for those who don't want to rely entirely on those budgets, there's a few other avenues we really look to. One is piggybacking. And so by piggybacking, we're looking for partners or like-minded communities that already have the people we want. And we want to build a connection with uh, the, the managers or the founders of those communities and essentially piggyback on top of the success they've had to get access to these people. Uh, so examples of that might be maybe you don't want to put $10,000 into a Facebook ad campaign, but maybe you could purchase an advertising spot or in, in a particular media website's newsletter, or you could write a guest post, or you could do some sort of exchange, a cross-promotional exchange with them over a period of six months where maybe front-end of that relationship, they're helping you, but then towards the back end, you're going to balance it out more and start helping them in, in different ways. So piggybacking and looking at those kind of partnerships is a really good route. Uh, another uh, effort we're going to look to is virality. It's a tough one because it's, it's you know, there, there are obviously elements to what makes something viral and, and check boxes that you can go through, but there's always an element of luck there. You don't really know for sure whether a big effort to go viral is going to work. And so it can be a bit of a risk, but virality, and, and that can be things such as word of mouth marketing strategies, referral strategies, um, fun content, user generated content, uh, things like um, ambassadors or affiliate marketing. Uh, we might even uh, include some influencer marketing in that. So we've got the virality is certainly a good a good path to go if you don't want to lean into pushing too much of your budget into paid ads. And then, I mean, the, the fourth and longest one, I suppose, is is the organic. You know, for people that don't have big budgets and and maybe don't, they say, oh, I don't have any partners or I don't have, I can't make things go viral. I can't get great videos created. If, you know, they're pushing back on a lot of different areas, then the way to go would be organic. And that's going to be slow and steady, but it's going to be, going through your social channels, posting relevant content, being an interesting person, being an interesting brand. And over time, you're then going to build up that community. If you were going to go that route, you wouldn't be working with someone like us because our, the whole point of working with us is we're going to do this quickly and, uh, in, a, in a short time frame. Uh, but organic is a perfectly good route to go. And many, many of the early brands in e-commerce did exactly that and have been very successful uh, through that methodology. So, if you're not going to go paid, I would go paid. That's always my recommendation. But if you're not going to lean too heavily into paid acquisition, then we're always looking at piggybacking and partnerships and looking at virality and opportunities there. And then also we're looking at 
I mean, how can we organically get visibility? That's awesome. Makes makes a lot of sense. Makes a lot of sense. Will, you've shared a lot of knowledge with us, and I love your five-step framework here and process to launch new products. Is there anything that we haven't covered yet that you think our audience needs to know about launching products and having success from the get-go? I think the, the main thing I would note, and this is very applicable to uh, folks that already have existing e-commerce businesses and existing customer bases, is to is to use them, you know, in a, in, a, in a positive way. But your answers are there. And, and, and if you're a new entrepreneur, you do have to spend money to build up your audiences. If you already have an audience because you already have a community, then you don't need to invest that time in doing it. You can run a validation with your own community without spending any dollars. And you can understand what does your community want, what, you know, what, what product uh, advances, accessories, upsells, are they interested in purchasing? What's missing from your existing um, product set that people are, people are seeking? Uh, you can do that through simple things like surveys. You can do that through driving traffic from an email newsletter to them to certain pages and seeing what their intent is and so on and so forth. And then to tie that back to something you mentioned earlier, Josh, is releasing new products. And I think that that ties in nicely with the fact that it's so much easier, especially in 2022, to sell more to a customer than to get a new customer. It, and that's always been the case. You know, that's something that's, that's, that's the best practice that has existed for a long time. But I would say, especially in the last couple of years, with the, with the way things are going, with the competitive costs of the digital space, uh, with some of the challenges we've seen this year, with the economy and recession and this and that, uh, there's no one that's going to be easier for you to generate more revenue from and provide more value to than someone who knows you and trusts you. So when it is about uh, launching more products, when it is about generating revenue, like you said, and I would just point wholeheartedly to an existing community. If you want to go through this launch system and you have an existing community, you're already so far ahead of all the entrepreneurs that don't and that this is such a, a low cost and, and verifiable and tangible path to just rolling out new products. And like we spoke about before, you don't even have to develop the product, you know, it, especially if you have an existing community, it can be a case of, oh, we are thinking about X, Y, and Z, and, put, what, and collecting feedback on those, on those thoughts, and even collecting down payments or deposits or pre-orders, so you're in fact getting that revenue before you're even manufacturing the product. Uh, so that's all to say, you know, if you have an existing community or if you're about to launch a business and you're building a community for that business and you're thinking longer term, thinking about what those additional products that you can add to that product development timeline and using your customers to make those decisions for you is just so important and such a cost saver in, in longer term profitability. Yeah, well, I think you summarized things really well there, um, especially for many of our listeners who are established business owners. This isn't their first product launch. They've already got a portfolio or a catalog of products. Um, now, Will, at the end of each episode, I love to leave the audience with three actionable takeaways from each episode. What I'm going to do a little bit differently today, though, is I'm going to take your kind of five-step framework or model that you talked about and really kind of apply it to our listeners that are primarily launching products on Amazon and dive even deeper to kind of what you just recently talked about there with an existing audience. So number one is you've got to validate that product. This goes back to the importance of creating product insert cards, right? So that when your customers with all of your existing products, when they that when they get their product and it arrives, there's got to be some type of product insert or maybe it's on your product label or packaging that shows a QR code with some type of hook or enticement to get them to join your email list or preferably they're a text list because your SMS marketing is going to be much more responsive, higher open rates, higher click through rates than email. But you've got to start gathering your audience. So while you're in the validation phase, 
you can reach out to your audience, just like Will mentioned, and you can say, hey, we are thinking of creating this type of new product. If you're interested, respond or click this link or whatever it is so that you can start to gauge interest. That's a really, really good way. But then number two, you can use the validation tools that we all have on Amazon. Go use Amazon brand analytics and go determine, right, what type of market market opportunity is there? How, how many keywords would be there supporting that type of product? What is the search volume? For those keywords and and how many different keywords can you find that are truly relevant that would drive traffic to that product right those are all the components that would comprise your validation stage then you move into number two is kind of building up that audience so again as an established business you should already have uh, your target audience you should already have a list of customers that have previously purchased from you so reach out to them, like I mentioned earlier, and send them a, a quick email or text that says, hey, I'm thinking of doing this. Complete this survey if you're interested. And here's one of the most powerful things. In that survey, one of the best questions I would recommend that you ask is when it comes to whatever product this is, when it comes to using, you know, kitchen spatulas, for example, what is the biggest obstacle, frustration, or challenge that you face, right? And let customers respond in their own words, and hopefully you will find patterns in there that will then help you kind of pivot and even reformulate what your new product offering could be to truly solve the pain points of the customers. Um, then you move into engaging with that audience. One of the best things that we've done is we'll kind of follow that similar pattern in our own business. We'll say, hey, we're thinking of creating this product. We'll send it out to our text list and we have people join a separate text list if they're interested. Then we keep them updated with pr the product development. All right, so we're thinking of coming out with five different types of variations or designs or whatever it is. And we show it and we say, hey, here's 10, but we need to narrow it down to five. Select your favorite five, right? and they feel like they're part of this process. And then we ask them various questions. Do you think this needs to include an eraser or does it need a marker? Or you know, what extra accessories do you think would, would make this the complete package for you, right? Ask all of those questions and you're building this engaged audience that is honestly going to be chomping at the bit asking, when is this going to become available because they've been so invested in the product creation at the same time. Then when it comes to conversions, specifically on Amazon, one of the things I would encourage you to do is if you have a list of 100,000 um, email subscribers um, or people that have, or let's boil it down to even 1,000, right? Because this, this applies to no matter the size of your list, but break them up into individual buckets. Because if you go back to the way when we all were launching products five years ago on Amazon, there was that CPR number, which still does exist today, that gives you like, here's the average daily sales that you should be meeting in order to get ranked on page number one. And so spread out your launch over a seven day period to say, hey, I'm going to send, you know, I have 1000 email, you know, subscribers, break that up into, you know, I'm going to send out campaigns. Monday, it's going to go to 150 people. Tuesday, it's going to go to 150 people, so on and so forth so that you're continuing to prime that engine day after day and Amazon will start picking up on that rather than seeing one huge spike, one huge blip on the radar, which Amazon doesn't really give a whole lot of love to at this point. So spread that out. And then last but not least is being able to scale that. So that goes back into including product inserts on your new product to continue to engage and build with that new audience in preparation for your new launch. So. Those are some of my ideas. That's how you could specifically apply it to seven figure sellers that are looking to scale to eight figures and beyond. Will, what are your thoughts? Is there anything you think I, I'm missing there or anything else you would like to add on to those thoughts? I mean, you, you're spot on. I mean, we, could, we could speak about each of those in, in so much depth. The two things you said that I want to reiterate, because I think they're so important. You talked about uh, 
collecting open-ended responses and using that information to understand pain points and so on. Uh, I think along those lines, something we do a lot of is, uh, is review research. And so we spend a lot of time on Amazon reviewing competitive products and understanding what are people saying about those products and the reviews, and then using those, those open-ended responses, not just to help decide what, exactly what product we want to launch, but to actually speak about that product in the same language and colloquialisms that the customers have been using elsewhere. So I think that research period of collecting open-ended answers is useful, not just to help decide you know, what path you want to go, but for the specific copywriting you want to be using in that launch approach. So I thought that was a very valuable uh, insight you added. And then you also mentioned segmentation. And when you first mentioned it, I was thinking about it in a slightly different way than what you said, uh, because you did apply it very specifically to Amazon, which is that's exactly how I launched my book. I had uh, you know, a list of 200 people and 30 a day over that first week. When you're thinking about launching in, in different ways, you can consider segmentation perhaps in slightly different manners. For example, if someone was crowdfunding uh, versus Amazon, then you are going to want that big blip. And so rather than thinking about segmentation just in um, kind of chronology over the course of a week, we think about segmentation, those launches in terms of priority to convert, like likely to convert. And, and we do it over the course of a day rather than the course of a week. So first thing, first segment that's going to go out is going to be the people who we feel extremely confident are going to convert. The last people we send an email to that day or a text message to that day are the people who we think are probably the least likely. And, and the reason that is, is because those people who are least likely are going to need more social proof, more credibility to make that purchasing decision. And so we want sales to come in, comments to have come in, reviews to have come in before that segment reaches the, the page and the sales offer. Uh, so those are both very good um, specific things you mentioned, Josh, that I, that I thought was, was spot on, yeah. Awesome. Thanks for tying that up in, in a bow there, Will. I think you did a great job at even expounding on a couple of that, those ideas. This has been a super fun conversation, Will. And before we finally wrap things up here, I love to ask um, each guest the following question. So, Question number one, what's been the most influential book that you've read and why? You know, I, I, apart from mine, <laughs> yeah, the, uh, I would have to say the e Michael Gerber's e I, I just think it's, for me, I was launching a, you know, I was someone who was a marketer and, and I moved into launching a marketing business and the way that Michael Gerber speaks and the ideas and the concepts that he brings up, I mean, when I read that book before I launched my business, it was just one of those books which really opens your mind and makes you really think strategically about what it is to have a business rather than, you know, what it is to kind of run a business on a day to day basis. So I would have to say, I mean, there's many, many, but the e myth is one that I think any entrepreneur would get a lot of value from. So e myth by Michael Gerber would be my choice there. Yeah, totally agree. That is a great book. Next question is, what is your favorite productivity tool or software that you've been using that you think is a game changer? So I think that the one that comes to my mind, I, I don't think it looks glamorous. However, the way I've used it over the years has just made it so powerful. So Toggle, it's a simple time tracking software. But I'm a big time tracker. And so since day one of my business, in day one of 2016, when I launched a business of education or training that didn't really work out, I've tracked my time and everything. So I can now look back and whether it's looking at over the course of a week, um, how I'm spending my time and every couple of years, I will assess my day, in both how much time I spend with my wife, how much time I spend eating and so on. Uh, but that, that data set to look back on is so incredibly useful to see, oh, wow, so I, in 2022, I spent this much time on business development. In 2021, I spent this much time. In 2020, I spent this much time. Or I spent this much time on team meetings. You know, that data set is so useful for me uh, to improve my efficiency, to improve, frankly, my, my balance of my life, that I would have to say Toggle for me has just been the, the best productivity software. And I've maintained use of it over the, all those years. Nothing else has kind of stayed with me through the whole time. 
Fascinating. So Toggle, T-O-G-G-L-E? No, Ian, just T-O-G-G-L. All right. Toggle. I have not heard of that one, but I really like the concept that you talked about there because when I talk to other entrepreneurs about scaling their teams, one of the first things I recommend they do is do a time study. You have to understand where you're spending the majority of your time, right? And so like you're talking about, you know, business development, right? Now, if that's your sweet spot and you're like, look, that's my core capability. I'm really good at it. I love it. That's exactly what I want to be doing day in and day out. Then that's well and good. But if you're like, well, it is something I'm good at, but I do think that somebody else, I could train somebody to do it just as well as I can. Then you start to outsource that, right? And you start to create processes around it. But you're not able to understand, uh, you know, where majority of your time is going if you're not tracking it. So I'm excited. I'm going to be taking a look at that immediately after we get off this call. So thanks for that, Will. Last mm -hmm. question here is who is somebody that you admire or respect the most in the e-commerce space and why? This is, a, this is a tough one. And I sat on this one thinking about, obviously this is one you said in advance, so I knew it was coming. Um, one thing I really try and avoid nowadays is, I guess, comparing myself to other individuals. So when I first started out, I, I looked at, I, you know, it was all about learning as much as possible. And so there were many entrepreneurs, well-known, whether it's uh, Mari Smith, who used to do a lot of meta work, or whether it's um, Michael Stelzner, the social media examiner, or Gary Vaynerchuk. You know, these were people at the time, Amy Porterfield, who were very well-known in this space and, and I could learn a lot from. But I think since 2016 to now, We've all seen how social media and what we learn about online is just a small slice of what reality is for that person. And so it's a very dangerous game. I, for me personally, emotionally, as an entrepreneur, to be comparing myself and studying other entrepreneurs in the e-commerce space too much because all I will see is success story, success story, success story, success story, how I generated $10 million in 30 seconds. And, and that, makes me feel bad about myself, you know, it makes you question yourself. So I, I, over the last few years, I've really tried to avoid following too many individuals. How, so, I, so I had a hard time answering this question, but one, one individual, not necessarily e-commerce, but I've found as an entrepreneur, a very useful resource is, is the podcast, How I Built This. Uh, Guy, Guy Raz is, is the, the host, I think. Um, but How I Built This, it's a podcast that I do still listen to and as an entrepreneur, I've just found incredibly useful because he interviews such a different variety of entrepreneurs in all sorts of different spaces. And so what you're speaking about, Josh, you know, hearing your customers speak about what they want, hearing what other entrepreneurs, more successful entrepreneurs have done and what their journey has been like in their business, whether it's an app or a travel brand or whatever it is, you hear the commonalities and you hear the trends. And so there's, there's a lot you can learn from those kind of conversations. So there's no one influence, or there's no influencer or, or e-commerce expert that I really follow avidly nowadays. Um, I do think Gary Vaynerchuk is a good, I didn't used to like him, but I think he says a lot of smart things nowadays. Um, I think he's a great guy to listen to. But if I was to recommend anything or single resource or single person, it would be the podcast, How I Built This, because I just think it's such a wealth of, knowledge in a very, and you hear about it in a very interesting, uh, interesting manner through his conversations. Yeah. Awesome. What a great recommendation. Thank you for that, Will. All right. To wrap things up, Will, where can people find your book, Launch in Five, and uh, where can people reach out to you and continue to follow you on your journey? Sure. Well, the book available on Amazon, so you can search for it on Amazon or Goodreads. Um, you can also go to the website www.launching5book, five, five with the number five, launching5book.com. Uh, you can buy it directly from me or you can buy it from Amazon on that, on that site as well. In terms of contacting me or following me, I mean, you can find me on all those, all those social media channels, Twitter, LinkedIn. Uh, I always welcome direct emails. So if anyone does have any follow-up questions they'd like to come to me with specifically, then you're always welcome to email me at will at russellmarketing.co. Um, so that's a great place to reach me directly. And just to check out a little bit more about the companies or what we've talked about today, our website, my, my launch marketing agency is russellmarketing.co. Uh, obviously the book we just went through, launching5book.com. 
And then for the foundation as well, which, which is a great initiative, also focusing on early stage entrepreneurs, just in a slightly different manner, uh, is russellgives.org. So all of those spots would be a great place to learn a little bit more about you know, what I'm about and what we do. And, and as I say, if anyone has any questions, they can always come to me directly. Awesome. Will, this has been a pleasure. Thank you so much. I, uh, you know, recommend our listeners go check out your book, give it a purchase and uh, help out another fellow entrepreneur. So thank you, Will, for coming on the show today. Thanks so much, Josh. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you for listening. Visit ecombreakthrough.com for more information. If you've enjoyed today's episode, the best way you can show your appreciation is by clicking the subscribe button and quickly leaving a review. See you again next time.